everyone. I'm Paul Hahn, coordinator of Mission to North America. Welcome to MA's continuing webinar series on strengthening the church. We're continuing a set of sessions with you on strengthening the church in the time of COVID. Today, we look at moving forward from this space in light of our hope in the gospel. I want to read to you a verse as we get going here. This is from Philippians chapter 1 in verse 12. Paul writes to the Philippian church, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Paul was writing from prison. He was writing from a space in which he was literally shackled, um, imprisoned unjustly, and yet was seeing the gospel advance among all the imperial guard, seeing the gospel go out in fresh ways in the church there and beyond. Um, this is our hope now in this space of amazing challenge. Um, as one of my friends, Scott Bridges, put it recently, asked him as we sat on my porch out here outside at my home in Athens, Georgia, Scott, who's the director of m and Unity Fund, the PCA Unity Fund, I said, Scott, how are you doing? And Scott said, well, I'm doing okay, considering we're living through a pandemic similar to the 1918-1919 Spanish flu. And we're living in a space that is much like uh, the financial challenges of the Great Depression and the Great Recession. And we're living in a space in which we're seeing great social movement and progress and conversation and yet backlash around all of that much like the 1960s, and all of that's been crammed into a three-month space. I'm doing okay, considering that. So that may be how you feel. There's a lot of upheaval. There's a lot of challenge in this space for all of us. Uh, and yet, how can we as Christians and how can we as Christian leaders help our churches look forward in this space? How can we look to Jesus, who is always building his church, to advance his gospel deeper in us and out wider in the world, even in this season. We've got a great panel today. I want to introduce them to you. I'm going to go around and let them sort of introduce themselves. Rod Miles, who's senior pastor, church planner, founding pastor, senior pastor at uh, Grace Church of Marin County, California. Rod, say hello to us and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, I, I go by pastor because uh, <laughs> there's just one of me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that's it. But uh, yeah, I'm, it's great, great to be with you. I, I uh, after uh, 16 years in banking, was called to pastoral ministry. And, and my first call was to plant a church in Marin County, which is just over the Golden Gate Bridge from uh from San Francisco, and it's if you've ever watched a sporting event that's taken place in San Francisco, the blimp or the helicopter will show the Golden Gate Bridge in this beautiful background, and we live in that beautiful background, and it's every bit as beautiful, probably more than you think. It's a place of uh, great beauty and great brokenness. It's a, um, a, a very wealthy place because of a supply-demand imbalance on housing. It's a very politically and theologically progressive place. It's also kind of funny. It's a, it's a, it's sort of has this uh, donut hole of, of a demographic where our, we're really lacking 20 somethings and 30 somethings. Mm -hmm. All the 20 somethings go to San Francisco or to Oakland and they move back in their late thirties or early forties. And so we have over 70% of our population is over 40 wow. and about 24% of it is under 20. And so we have we have, we're really kind of struggling in, in terms of just being impoverished by not having that 20 and 30 something yeah. demographic, but uh, we, it, we've been here for 17 years. And, wow. Um, Planter, I, I, founder, I, I, organizing I, pastor, and you're meeting in a, in a small college campus there, right? But you're right. possibly moving into a new more permanent space coming up. Is that correct? Well, we're, we're uh, th yeah, that's, that's, Possibly. Uh, okay. we, we, we worship at the College of Marin and have a great relationship with them. There's a, a little church in my town within the county called San Anselmo that uh, recently 
uh, voted to dissolve and they'd like to join in with us. And they have a building that was built a long time ago. It has a small sanctuary and it hadn't had much work since 1955. And so wow. uh, we're going to receive that as a gift, Lord willing. And, uh, we, and then, we go from there. Yeah. yeah, we'll make some decisions about that. Awesome. Thanks, Rod, for being with us. Charles Anderson is here, lead pastor of Redeemer Church of Indianapolis. Charles, tell us uh, how long you've been there, a little about yourself, a little bit about the church. So I, we've been here for three years, and uh, Redeemer's about 20 years old or so. It was planted in um, the late 90s, and Urban Church, so we are just north of downtown, uh, which, you know, obviously in terms of our location means a lot, particularly in the context of right now and unrest and, and some of those kinds of things. And uh, about me, so I um, we moved here obviously to come to Redeemer. Um, I've been kind of before that both pastor and uh, a professor um, in New Testament, uh, so I've kind of done straddled both sides in terms of ministry, academic and pastoral. And uh, the church, very much kind of in our location. Um, so we actually own the old First Presbyterian building. So wow. uh, back, wow. President Benjamin Harrison was on the kind of the the. Wow. you know, the, the first pres kind of session when it was built. Um, and so there's a crazy story how Redeemer ended up buying it before we were even particularized. And, um, and then we founded an arts organization as a partner that actually occupies most of the building. So we're a big church that owns a big building that has to operate like a, uh, like sometimes like a church plant, because we don't actually you know, most of the space is actually given over to artist studios and galleries and all in. So it's separate. It's, it's not faith-based, um, but we founded it and it's a partner and it's about kind of how do we do cultural renewal in the city. So it's a little Wonderful. bit about me and us. Thank you, Charles. Remember, that'll be on the quiz at the end, which PCA church has a connection to President Benjamin Harrison. Just get ready for the quiz at the end. Okay, Redeemer Knoxville friends. Hello down there. Sean Slate, uh, lead pastor, was hoping to be with us. He's still on the road coming back from vacation. We have two wonderful representatives of the staff there, Josh McQuaid and Karen Ems. Introduce yourself, guys, and tell us a little bit about Redeemer Knoxville. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, so my name is Josh McQuaid. I'm a, the director of youth and mission here at Redeemer. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Redeemer and then let Karen introduce herself and her role. But uh, so the Redeemer is a, a church in Urban University in Knoxville. We can throw a rock and hit the University of Tennessee. Um, literally, we don't, but we could. Um, but we love the university. We're, uh, we're under normal circumstances when school is in session. Uh, our neighborhood doesn't really have families in it. It has university students in it. So uh, we have a close relationship with RUF and just love, love that ministry, love the university. Um, and love Knoxville. We have a, a pretty um, vibrant uh, urban mission uh, here, working with local uh, elementary schools, working to serve our, the homeless population of the city. Um, that's just a beautiful part of Redeemer's mission. So uh, it's a little bit about me. I'll let Karen introduce herself. Yeah, I'm Karen Enns, and I am the director of Women, Children, and Administration, so a small staff and a little bit of everything. And we are kind of the opposite of Rod in California, that we have a heavy population of people in their 20s and 30s. And we kind of start the drop off after that. And the retired population, we are almost uh, it's not present. Um, so we, we are having challenges um, that are opposite, but similar. Thanks, Karen. Yes, I'm, I, yes. So they have overcome that and they're going forward beautifully. A great picture of what we're talking about. Uh, lastly, and not least at all, we have Solomon Smothers and Parker James. Wave to us, guys, here in Athens, Georgia, planting Lord of Glory uh, Church here in Athens. Parker, once you start, Solomon, say hello as well. So. Yeah, so we're a church plant that just launched worship in uh, January of 2019. Uh, we're a cross-cultural church plant in the heart of the city. Uh, we had a long ramp up uh, before launch because we really we partnered locally uh, with what God was already doing in the neighborhood. And actually, me and my family, we joined as associate members of a historically black missionary Baptist church called Hill Chapel. 
and it's been an amazing partnership. God is really moving in it. He's blessed that and uh, seeing a lot of people come together um, across boundaries in our city and walking in unity and light um, and and managing COVID at the same time. Uh, we, we're glad to not be uh, saddled with a building right now uh so we're not we're not in that position we're kind of still on pilgrimage and uh we we have used and shared space with uh hill chapel which has really become a mother church to us an adoptive mother um and so solomon came on board uh as a key partner i didn't want to launch without having uh cross-cultural leadership together and waited for years and searched and and found solomon was right here in town already so, yeah, uh, so I, I'm coming from a perspective of um, doing some nonprofit work in the city, <clears throat> also doing campus ministry for a while, um, and really just saw the work that Parker and his wife Adele were doing uh, with the church and wanted to just join, like, you know, my family wants to join the church. And then lo and behold, God started doing some things uh, that was surprising to me, maybe not so much to Parker. Uh, to bring me in as the co-pastor that we were looking for. So Hallelujah. we've been ministering together since, um, I guess, technically 2018 or so. Um, and uh, again, obviously, COVID has been uh, a crazy, crazy time. Um, but but it is a blessing to be a church plant in a time uh, like this because there's no there's no old way that we've done it before, right? Everything is new. So it's um, all of the things that we were employing, the, the, the flexibility and dexterity of thought that we were employing before, you know, have have another avenue, right, to deal with this particular challenge. There so you, go. you can't help but look forward, right? There's nothing. Yeah, back. There's, no, there's no back, right? There's, there's no back. We want to talk about looking forward. We want to start first by sort of how are each of you experiencing the grace of Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father in fresh ways in your own journey in this space? How is Jesus coming to you, meeting with you, renewing you, helping you endure and, and look forward personally as a Christian. So Rod, I know maybe, you know, you're in a unique time as well, even today. Um, your father's quite ill. How, how, how is Jesus meeting you, sustaining you, helping you look forward as, as a Christian? You know, uh, I was thinking about this since you had asked, a, you know, given me a little warm up uh, or plan that you'd say that. And um, I think, you know, sometimes when you uh, hear somebody who helped out at a, uh, uh, you know, at a, at a fire or some big event, they say my training just kind of kicked in. And I kind of think that's sort of what's happening with me personally is sort of like my training's kicking in. And, and I, 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 I've been just running hard. I think Jesus is meeting me in terms of just sustaining me uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, I think that sort of the training to, to, to hear and to see the, the gifts of God and the grace of God are, are things that, uh, you know, sort of you, you work hard at training yourself and by gosh, they, they, they come to pass when mm -hmm. the, the going gets tough. And so I would say that, that I, you know, I think, uh, just sort of walking in the confidence of God and then sort of the sobriety of my own stuff and my mm -hmm. own, my own ability and the reliance upon Christ. And I'd say, I, I, I've done a reasonably faithful job of, of uh, praying the common worship daily prayer, something that mm -hmm. I learned in seminary and mm -hmm. has a great rhythm to it that uh, sort of wakes you up in the morning and prepares you for the day. And then mm -hmm. when you go to bed, you sort of, you know, confess the ways in which you failed and ask God to carry you. And so I've actually slept well at night. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of think that that pattern of prayer is good. And then I, I'd say also that I think just framing, um, you know, we, we, we're part of a story. And this is, this yeah. is a part of uh, God's story. And there's seasons that, that uh, of plenty and seasons of wants. And so I just think knowing the knowing our own story, knowing the story of redemption, knowing the, the, the times that people have, have had to walk through. And this is, this is a time for us. This is a, yeah. a, an important season for us to lean into the grace of God, to lean into our confidence in God, to, to be tested and, and shown our stuff and exposed and, and, uh, and sort of lean into being okay to be exposed. And 
there's there there are gracious hands to fall into. So it's, I don't I don't I hope that's helpful. I don't I don't no, know if it is, but, but I, I think helpful, it's really, yeah, yeah. It, leaning into your training. <laughs> Meaning in your training, ordinary means of grace, daily prayer, uh, recognizing that seasons of pruning personally and, and more communally and globally are part of the church's story yeah. and part of God's way of working us. That's, that's beautiful. As you're listening, um, you know, here, I know somebody's already doing that. Looks like Robert is already doing that. Feel free to jump in on the chat page and toss us questions. Uh, my staff and I will be looking at those and try to get those to the panelists as we go. Charles, how's, how's the Lord meeting you? What do you sort of say? Where's there a fresh experience of Jesus? Um, how are you able to personally sort of look forward in this space rather than just sort of pining away for what's past? Yeah, so I'll be, to be frank, the, this, the summer has particularly felt like a time of dryness for me. Um, so I kind of think of you know, since mid-March, kind of this season in, in two halves. And I think that first part up to late May or so was actually really sweet. And um, I think a time of renewal for me in, in prayer and all. And it's been different this summer. It's been a lot harder. Um, so the we're preaching through the Psalms and we're talking about the seasons of the soul, kind of a playoff of Calvin's quote. And, um, and actually has been good in terms of trying to engage those emotional states. And um, one of our RUF, uh, you know, uh, campus minister partners from Purdue preached a couple weeks ago from Psalm 6. And he, I, he really named it well, like the, that sense of powerlessness that, that so many of us are experiencing. And so I have been kind of, we talked about that as a, as a, as elders afterwards. And I'm, so that's, I'm trying to lean into that kind of sense of powerlessness and how do I bring that to Jesus uh, both kind of on my own and then mm -hmm. as a family and then as a, as a, you know, a family of leaders and, and all. So, you know, I uh, get on a, to get on a webinar. I'd, I wish I could have a better answer, but like, that's actually where I'm at is, is oh, that sense of kind of. So, it's so good, Charles. So, you know, not denying the powerlessness, not trying to sort of scratch and claw to overcome it, but acknowledging it, bringing it to the Lord, letting his strength come into our weakness and, and move personally and through us. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, folks at Redeemer Knoxville, Karen, why don't you start? How's, how's Jesus meeting you in this time? And, and how is he helping you sort of look ahead and not just sort of mourn what's lost right now? Yeah, well, sometimes I, it's been really hard. Um, been hard both as a, a church staff member as well as personally I have young kids who are all of a sudden at home all the time yeah. and try to figure out at the beginning of all this to try to figure out how to be a good uh, worker and how to be honoring to God and that as well as be a good parent and then it's into my children felt like I was failing at everything because I was um and so it's been, it's been constant pivots. I think it's been a sweet time of um, cleaning into Jesus. We made this liturgy book at our church actually before the pandemic hit, but then it created this time and time of prayer that we were able to do as staff and officers every morning for months um, together on Zoom and to be able to do that together and to kind of center our days has been sweet. Were, were you going to do it in person until COVID and pivoted to Zoom or, or were you always going to do it on Zoom? Well, as a staff, we do it together um, yeah. mornings and we, we give it to our entire church body. It's on our website, yeah. for, but we pivoted to Zoom and it was a really sweet time to include our officers and that yeah. as well. That's great. Josh, how about you? How's... How's Jesus meeting you in this space? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of Karen's experiences are my experiences too. I, I'm in a similar stage of life with young kids at home and just really trying to figure out how to father well and lead my family well and feeling most of the time like you're not doing it well. Um, and I, I think for me, one of the over, overarching lessons in this for me has been like everything is changing, everything's disrupted, nothing is the way that we wish it was. Um, and yet Jesus really never changes. He's just constant and faithful. Um, and that's really good news. It's good news that I need to be reminded of personally. 
every day. It's good news that as people in the church come with, with their challenges, um, that's good news that they need to be reminded of as well, that you feel like your life is falling apart, um, but Jesus really is the same today as he was yesterday. Mm. Uh, his, his plans are moved forward through disruption, not through comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, and just really trying to be mindful of that, not just intellectually, but um, in my heart too. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's sort of what I've been hanging on to and trying to remind myself of uh, it would feel true. Um, but remember, really that. experiencing the stability and sovereignty of God in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you for these questions that are coming in. We're going to hit those in a bit. Uh, I know, Solomon, there's one specifically for you. We'll hit in just a few minutes, but. Solomon, once you start, how's Jesus meeting you there in the day? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jesus is very, very kind. <laughs> um, and he has just been really showing me just how kind he is with the, the ways that my family has not been particularly uh, directly impacted by this illness and uh, just a number of blessings that he's he's bestowed onto me and my family uh, during this crazy, crazy time. Um, and really, it's just that to be um, re- like to have my vision again pressed up into the idea of grace um, that I really do deserve death, and he has given me the best of life. Um, it's just been an amazing, uh, an amazing thought um, that has just been uh, just so present um, during this time. So all that said, like life is hard, right? You know, having the kids at home all the time is really difficult, and um, we've got a number of people who are going through some real challenges um, during this time: uh, financial, uh, you know, mental, spiritual challenges, familial challenges, just like relationship issues. And these would have been problems before there was like the the weight and anxiety of a global pandemic uh, and racial injustice and all of these other things that are happening in the world. We, you know, add all that up. It's it's pretty, um, pretty amazing. So the thing that that in in, in recognizing God's grace um, that he's really been kind of drawing me to. uh, And it's I love what you were saying, Rod, about remember your training. Um, One of the ways that God has been so kind to us is. I want to say in like November or so, the Lord really pressed in on us um, the need to to like re-engage in, in, in working through spiritual disciplines in our own lives um, and to start sharing that with our church. Um, and it has been the difference between uh, like sanity and insanity, at least for me. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is really lean into... Um, sharing that right sharing and equipping the church through spiritual disciplines this these old timeless things that the church has always done um giving those 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 tools to people um so that they can get uh, just move through some of the 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 stuff and the gunk that's in the way between them and god and he can actually do what he always does which is bring the the light and the beauty and the love of himself to a to a dark situation um, so that's been that's been the way that God's been moving, um, and it's been, you know, powerful. The thing the, the thing that I, I just think about again is just the, the the thought that He's pressed into me is that the whole concept of Christian faith, right, mm. is dependent on the worst thing that has ever happened, mm. right? The death of Jesus was far worse than COVID nineteen, and far worse than murder hornets in twenty twenty. Um, and if that actually does work in our favor, if that um, is a blessing to the church, then even though I don't really see it, I can believe um, that 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 we're going to figure this out, that the Lord will not abandon us and that the church will be um, all the more powerful um, in this year and, and in the future. I have to believe that um, because that's what I think re- resurrection speaks to me. So. That's beautiful. Any thoughts for you? How Jesus is meeting you? Well, I think everyone's comments are germane. What's happening with me, uh, very much uh, a sense that a lot of the props have been removed and uh, a lot of the the things that you think are are going to be steady or or reliant upon 
uh, when the Lord when the Lord removes those things, uh, He is inviting us, I believe, to draw near and uh, to draw near to Himself to to once again find that we're founded upon the rock and we're not leaning on the other props which are or uh, whether it has to do with uh, how much income we have or uh, the stability of the even the the congregational constituency of our church or whether it has to do with our sense of being able to exercise our gifts um, before people yeah. and be appreciated for that in the same ways or whether it even comes down to um, you know whether we're sick or whether we we have uh, a home. So one of the things that happened to me, uh, my wife, uh, she did get sick right around the time of shelter uh, came in March, and and I happened to be away with the kids because it was spring break, and we never went home for three weeks uh, mm-hmm. while she recovered. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure she had COVID, even though she had negative, um, you know, test. It was. Uh, the doctor basically diagnosed her because she had all the other symptoms, but she didn't have a fever. She, she, the Lord saved her. She didn't, she didn't die. And I was teaching my kids for like three weeks at my mom's house and everything was on me. And then we found out, uh, in the midst of this in May, after she was better and we were home, we were going to replace the carpet. We had it scheduled in our upper floor of our house. And we found out uh, once the carpet was removed, which I did myself, and the contractor came in, he started to install the wood floor, and he realized that our entire upper floor has been built up on attic rafters. Our our house is 100 years old, and 40 years ago, they just popped in an upper floor on top of these attic rafters, no floor choice. So it turns out... We don't, we're not, we thought we were doing a three week project, you know, and it's got a certain budget for it. And then now we had to move entirely out of our house. The entire upper floor of the house has to be rebuilt. Uh, it's not covered by insurance. Uh, we're renting a house right now, which we've, we've rented for the summer, uh, like 10 houses down. We happen to, the Lord led us to a place there, but we're only there for one more week and we're getting ready to move into another house, which is really in the heart of the neighborhood where we've been doing a lot of outreach and uh, it's a stone's throw from where we are now, but it's deeper into the heart of where we've been and, and we're just, we're trusting God. Uh, and every time I turn around, it's like the Lord saying, no, you're not going to rely on this. You're not going to rely on that. You're not going to rely on the other, but here I am. And he's blessing us when we follow that leading. The temptation is to retreat into comfort zones and to try to regain control. Right. And I've done some of that too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I've had to, I've had to confess and repent, you know, yeah. and we were a church plant too. We don't, we, we've been trying to figure out where all the resources going to come from right now. We, we can afford to really pay one pastor, but not really two. Yeah. And so, uh, what's that look like? But am I in ministry because I'm getting paid a certain amount or what have you? Wait, it, that's not why I'm doing it. Right. So, uh, it's for King Jesus, it's for His glory, and, and, and when we repent and when we trust Him, I mean, some maybe later in the call I'll talk more about what He's doing with moving into this new house, but I mean, already mission things we've been praying for for years, just in the past two weeks, have started popping like, like, like fire. I mean, it's just, things are happening. Yeah. So good. Thanks, guys, for sharing. I'm going to get into some particulars of life and ministry now. That's beautiful. Uh, I'm going to go to Redeemer Knoxville folks because I, I was laughing. I don't know if you were laughing similarly. Uh, when you hear about a floor put wrongly on top of something, you're maybe thinking of the Redeemer Sanctuary. So uh, <laughs> that's another story and an inside joke there. But anyway, um, Karen, why don't you start, talk about, because I think you all have done such a good job with the phases of reopening. So we're getting some questions here on what different churches are doing. Are you meeting? Where are you in the journey of reopening? I think you all have done such a good job from your virtual presence to a phased reopening. Talk about that story a little bit and and where you are with that, Karen. Yeah, so we said um, all along, as I'm sure many of your church members and leaders have asked about what date are you doing things, we said all along that we're phasing and not dating. and part of that is it is a continual process. I mean, I feel like every week we're talking about, are we doing the right thing? Do we need to pull back? Is it ready for more? And that is a weekly conversation that takes up time that it should right now. But we started, um, we were allowed to start in the state of Tennessee to start gathering 
at half capacity of our church um, really early at the end of May. And we did not feel right about that. We decided early on that we would do the guidelines that were for social gatherings, um, not just for religious gatherings, because that's what we felt safest about. Um, and we even slowed into that. So we started with outdoor 50 person or less communion services, and we can describe how those communion services went. We organized them by um, shepherding groups. So our elders, um, the, the members under their care and community groups, that way if people were coming, they were seeing people, it was a connection point for our congregation to see familiar faces and we've all desired to see people in person. And so we did those outside. There was lots of challenges with them. Um, one day the staff almost melted from, the, and we were out there for six hours straight because the services were wow. 20 yeah. an hour apart or on the hour. So we had time to get one crowd out and the next crowd in. And we did almost melt a couple days. Um, so then we got tents out. We thought this is going to be a great idea. We're going to have a bunch of tents. And then the tents almost all blew away in the middle of the service. So it's not that they weren't without challenge, but it was a good um, ease in. We redid how we did communion. We used to do bread that everybody pulled off. Then all of a sudden we did little pieces of crackers that were in a communion cup underneath the wine or grape juice so that no one would have to touch each other. We even distanced the ones in the thing. Everyone wore masks, even though they were outside. Um, we have eased um, very slowly into in-person services, but we added services, even knowing that we would have a much lower attendance rate just so that we could keep our numbers down. We're asking for people to register like many of you um, so that we can have contact tracing. And we did at one of our communion services find out that somebody was positive and spent a lot of time with our health department and they reiterated how important having those, the way to care for people and the way to love our neighbors and our communities is by doing that contact tracing. So that's where we're at right now. I mean, I think we're, we are not doing nurseries right now. So our services, we've cut down the time to be an hour and they're really hard on parents. <laughs> uh, you can really speak to that, huh? Yes, right, yeah. Stressful. Right. I'm glad that I get to go to the second and third service. Right. So now, a little bit you're, you're inside now, you're doing three services inside, correct? Okay. Um, so, limit those to 25 percent capacity we make people every other service they have to sit on different rows and then more than six feet apart yeah. from house yeah karen and josh if you could get to tracy any written for all of you if there are written materials on any of this that you would like to share please send that to tracy and she'll get that to all and Thanks. josh has done yeah a an amazing uh, knowledge and pivot as he has turned into um, recording live stream master. So he can speak yeah. to that was somebody's question is if yeah. we're in person and live streaming or what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have done a great job just real quickly. Your live streaming, your, your Sunday videos have been some of the best I've seen. What do you think are some keys to that? for those that are, that are still trying to figure that out? I mean, I think it's so much of it is probably dependent on uh, what you're trying to accomplish, how your services work. I think one thing that we did that made our lives so much easier was uh, we, uh, we figured out how to just keep the service as, as consistent and as much the same as our regular service as possible, and then adapted our technology to support that rather than the other way around. Um, and so as I looked at other churches and, and observed, one of the things that I saw was a lot of people trying to change their service to make it fit the technology that was available to them. And we just thought, no, like the, the worship service, that's what needs to stay the same. I and mean, we need to adapt everything else to that. And so yeah. that, that's probably the biggest thing for us. And then we just went and figured out what do we need yeah. to get for yeah. that to over. It's more. really good. Yeah. I, I thought it was live for the first couple of weeks that I watched it and it was, it was recorded. Uh, Charles, I want to pivot to you there a little bit. And um, we're getting a question down here. I think it's good. I'd love for you to talk about where you all are on reopening as well. 
different part of the country there in Indianapolis. Where are you and in, in a in a in a church that's you know a larger church? Um, but also, um, there's a great question down here about how are you sort of resetting benchmarks um, for church life? And I, maybe you can weave that in this. How are you and your team resetting benchmarks for thinking about where we are as a congregation? Yeah, so we have been since late June, and we had the freedom to do it earlier, kind of like Knoxville did, but we waited until late June. And in fact, we waited in part because even as we met as a, as a as an entire session in the beginning of June to kind of talk and and to officially kind of pray and vote together, we actually said, you know what, we're going to wait a little bit longer. And partly I said, I, I don't have the capacity because I really feel like we need to give attention right now to racial injustice and unrest and how do we shepherd our congregation in that. So I I said to the, to the session, I feel like we need to wait longer before we reopen in terms of that. And that was, it was a really sweet moment of kind of in that space to be able to say, yes. I mean, I think a lot of sessions, uh, a pastor might be afraid to admit, hey, I, I can't do this. Um, and that's the opposite of our session of, of a kind of walking together in, in brokenness beautiful. and humility. So that was, that was a sweet moment for me, for us together. So um, we've been, I mean, in, similar like each week we're pivoting we're nuancing um from the beginning i'd kind of said look we're going to see fewer people come back than we think and and that's even been more true than i expected i tried to lower the, the lower yeah. the expectations and it's actually been lower than that in some yeah. ways i mean i think we're seeing a gradual uh, uptick um, we're doing two services one of the things we thought we saw was live streaming became harder once we were in the sanctuary again yes. because of yes. like just even technical kind of yeah. suddenly a lot more people on their phones in there and it starts yes. competing for the signal. So even we've had to figure that out week to week and get better. So it felt like we figured out what we were doing and then we regressed in some ways on the yeah. live stream. Um, so, I mean, I think, so in terms of the, the benchmark and, and this kind of even pivots to what does it mean to look forward? I mean, my heart is, is we're praying and as we're thinking about what is particularly what's the next kind of thing look like. I'm super concerned about what I perceive as this kind of uh, a general drift and disengagement. So uh, a kind of the reality that, you know, as one of my, as one of my colleagues says, we're, we're four months into no church disease and the way in which that shapes our heart and the, that kind of habitual, hey, I'm not going and gathering in person and maybe I'm live streaming or I'll get to it when I get to it and just kind of the ways in which that's forming people and I can see it in conversations, I can see it in data, and I think that's my concern. And so we're actually getting ready to, and this is not a small undertaking, but we as, as teaching and ruling elders, we're gonna call through our entire membership. We did it back in April, but when these things first happened, we're gonna do it again. And, um, and each, really the question is gonna be, hey, A, how are you doing? But then B, how can we help you engage here in the fall? What does it mean for you to be engaging in worship? Um, does that need to be live stream still? Great. How do you engage and not just passively watch? Or can it be in person? What does that look like? How are you going to engage in community? And so I think that's, a, that's kind of where we're at is how do we shepherd our people in a, a sense of instead of drifting, instead of kind of the distraction how do you actually turn toward, hey, I'm going to be about the means of grace. I'm going to be about the old true things of like connection with Jesus and therefore connection with each other in order for my faith to be sustained. So that's a, that's a big part for us right now, I think. That's really good. Uh, benchmarking. So you're running two services. Yes. Aaron, you guys are doing three right now. Okay. Um, I have seen just in my interactions across the, the, the continent, um, a good benchmark just that I've observed is when you're getting started back, a first level to sort of get to is about one sixth of your pre COVID attendance live. And then if you can kind of get to one third of your pre COVID attendance, that, that becomes a place that you can kind of reset from. But a lot of places we had Ricky Jones on, who's one of my favorite guys around, very thoughtful, very gifted in Tulsa, great church river Oaks in Tulsa. And they had a wonderful plan. They were on our first webinar on reopening. And, um, and you know, they're a church of about 600. 
and they started with like 40 people coming the first couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, so and, yeah. Let me just jump in and, and even pick up one of the questions that somebody asked about data. So um, we we started where we are right now. So we've been what seven weeks back, and just this week we were at thirty percent of in terms of in person relative to what we were in in yes. kind of February. So we're kind of getting there. Um, I think. I mean, it's. I think July. I mean, July is always our lowest month because of vacation and all. So that adds to it. I think that exacerbates. I think we noticed. Um, so I'll say this. We. I mean. Data is imperfect, but we've had a consistent methodology. And what we saw was those first weeks, we saw a much higher engagement in terms of online worship than we had in person. Yes. And then a kind of a, a move down, but particularly yeah. beginning of June, which is when uh, Indianapolis went kind of from stage two to stage three and reopening. That was really kind of the pivot of like, we suddenly plummeted. And so, you know, best guess for us, we're at like around 400 or so between in-person and online between the two, you know, both in June and July, which is two thirds of what we would be normally. So that's kind of what I'm saying. When I'm noticing the data, that's part of it is that kind of downward. It doesn't help that it's summer. Most community groups take right. the summer off. So lots of things feeding into that. But you're thinking in terms of who's online and who's there to yeah. think about who you're connected. Right. Good. And I'm not saying our, it's great, yeah. but at least it's consistent. Sorry, no, that's I'll good. Let somebody else that's jump. That's good. In. And somebody wrote in, "What do I mean by one six or one third? There's nothing magical about those. Those are just markers that I'm observing. Um, you know, a lot of times as you're getting going, getting to one six is is a space to get to to sort of shoot for. And then if you can get to one third, if you're a church of 300 active in worship, getting to 100 there personally is a really good goal to shoot for. And then some of you are writing in, yeah, we're like 30 to 50 percent. I know some places around 50%. Rod, where are you guys? Have y'all even begun to meet again? You're in a different part of the country than the rest of us. Uh, yeah, talk yeah. about where you are. Yeah, uh, it's it's complex. And, and uh, I have rumbly in my tumbly about it, uh, to be honest with you. I um, One, we, we worship at a local junior college that's closed until, until 2021 uh, in terms of uh, accepting people on campus. And so that's a challenge. Uh, Two, uh, just culturally, uh, while we are radically progressive uh, politically and theologically, in the, the county is, uh, the, the people are very conservative in terms of public health. And so uh, like this thing that the letter that John MacArthur wrote in Southern California is like, it's anathema in Northern California. Uh, and um, and it, it's, it's so, um, there are churches that are doing some outdoor things. The thing that I'm, you know, maybe uh, this is, so you're asking me, and if, I hope this is some way useful to somebody else, but I'm solo, and uh, I, I can't do it, uh, you know, in, in one sense. And, and then secondly, I don't want to do something poorly. Yeah. And uh, we, I, I feel like, at least from the feedback of our people, we've been doing a live webinar and we've restructured the, surf, the, the order of worship to be shorter and to, and to acknowledge that we're doing it by way of a webinar. And our people have really enjoyed it. Our people really like it. They send, we have an app and they take pictures of themselves worshiping as a family and, and share them on the app. And there's mm -hmm. a pretty good, um, you know, esprit de corps uh, about that. And what I, what I really struggle with is like, going outside to a public space and doing something poorly and then trying to live stream it and not having the capability to do it. And so anyway, I, I really struggle with it. And so what we're trying to do is do the things that we do well, well, and stay at them. And so uh, my elders are very supportive and they want to keep on doing what we're doing. We're also doing, I noticed somebody in the chat asked about Sunday school. And we are doing Zoom Sunday School every week, and we're doing it with three sections of kids. And that's a lot to do as well. And uh, I, on the one hand, some of our parents say their kids are Zoomed out, and so we say, take a break. But yeah. on the other hand, like, especially during summer, there's no Zoom, and they are loving it. And the, we have some uh, uh, college kids who are part of our congregation, and they come back in the summertime 
or they're somewhere, or they're somewhere else at the same time. But our college kids have been doing the Zoom Sunday school, and our kids love the college kids doing the Zoom Sunday school. And the lessons are uh, 15 minutes long. There, it's a goat rodeo, but we're taught honestly. We're teaching the means of grace. We're teaching the elements of worship, and so that our kids can. You know, like we make a big deal about intergenerational worship. And so we make a, a children's worship folder and, and we talk to the children during worship and we lead them through the, the yeah. order of worship where we practice the means of grace. And we tell them what we're doing. And so um, I think what we're trying to do is just do what we do well and then pivot as God allows and as the county opens yeah. up. And, and so I don't know well, if that's... I, I, love, I love what one of the chat comments was just there you're you've sort of adapted worship to fit technology and that's a good plan you know, karen and josh are sort of saying we're trying to find the right, right technology to to fit what we do in worship and i think you can throw different pitches at different times it, it would, there's not a right way to do that rod can you get some links to tracy for people to see those sure. how they could access a, a, a recording of the the webinar service, yeah. or especially the Sunday school we're getting requests for, if you can yeah. get that to everybody. Well, we, we're not recording the Sunday school, so I, okay. can't, give, I can't give you those. Um, but I, Maybe a contact for somebody that can yeah, talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our, our uh, children's director is like, she's a superstar. Okay. And, she, and she's just adapting. And so what we're trying to do is it's me and our children's director and a part-time music guy. Right. And we're doing the very best we can do with the resources that we have in the season that we are. And I, I think our people are recognizing that and just quite appreciative. And we just don't have the bandwidth or the place, frankly, to yeah. go somewhere else. And we are in the process of absorbing a, a church that has a building, but it's an old building, it's dark. And I just, I hate the idea of us going into an old dark building and and asking 30 people to show up. And it's just not, and then, and then, I don't know. I, I'm. I I want to do whatever we do well, and and uh, and I know we we have had some people complain and and threaten us, and I just yeah. say, you know, like this is who we are and where we are. We're gonna and if you know. Let, let me just let me say one thing on that, and then I'm gonna, Karen. I want to pivot quickly to you to talk about children's ministry while we're on that. Then Solomon and Parker, we're gonna come to you and talk about church planning in this space. And Solomon, a specific question for you terms of cost cultural ministry. But just let me make a comment here briefly. I, I a lot of people call me. I'm I'm in touch with a lot, maybe a lot of you even on here. Um, um, and I would just say one of the things that is breaking my heart the most is when I'm hearing about pettiness creating divisions in the church in this season. If we ever need to bear with one another, you know, please don't leave your church because your session asks you to wear a mask. Or, or please don't be offended if somebody else is choosing not to wear a mask. Uh, please, please bear with one another. Please bear with your church session if they've decided they want to go virtual longer. It doesn't mean they're denying the faith or bowing to Caesar rather than to Jesus. Everyone is trying to serve King Jesus, shepherd his flock, reach out. Let us bear with one another in love. Let us demonstrate our discipleship by our love for one another in, in this season, please. I just, I would plead with you for that um, and beseech you for that. Karen, just real quickly before we get lots of questions here about children's ministry. Um, we've done a whole webinar on that. You can go back, Tracy, maybe send a link to the whole webinar that was dedicated to that for folks here. Uh, but, but Karen, any comments you have, what are you all learning about children's ministry? Yeah, for children's ministry for us, we really have taken a pause as far as what Sunday children's ministry looks like in a traditional sense. And we did pivots early on, we are, and we're keeping those up. It's a way for us that we've engaged also our volunteers as well as um, engaging and connecting with our, with our kids and with our students. So we've done Children's Worship Wednesdays, which are online. Um, they're on our social media. And we just, we have a different volunteer read from the same book every week. And then we have our music person play a song. I do an intro every week. Josh does the magic to make them all look like we know what we're doing. Um, and so that's been something that we've kept up. And it, it, one of the side benefits of that is still engaging our volunteers 
who we don't want to lose this volunteer base that we all know that we've worked hard to, to build up. Um, we don't know when we're going to start children's ministry as a whole, but we're doing also monthly mailers to the houses. Around Holy Week, we did a lot. We dropped off homes to their houses. We also did mailers, but some of our mailers were really fun. We, li we live, we are in a really old building, and so we have had squirrels in our building before. So we decided to name um, a mascot, and we named it Fort C the Squirrel because we're in Fort Sanders. And we sent Fort C, a flat Fort C, to all of our children's worship and nursery families and ask them to send us pictures of their adventures then we post them on social media it's a way to connect our students and our kids and our families even when we're not um, able to meet with them regularly some of the mailers have been heavy on content and then some of them have been lighter we've also done online zoom bingo which is really easy to do and actually borderline fun <laughs> Um, but it takes no time. It's been a way really to connect families and allow them to see each other, especially the families that aren't ready to come back to church for one way or another. And then we've really upped our children's activity bags on Sunday mornings. They're single use now. We used to do reusable ones. Now they're single use. We even put goldfish in them because guess what? Kids don't talk as much when they're eating. Um, and so that's a side benefit, but they also have sermon notes and other specific pages for each week. That's awesome. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Okay, Parker and Solomon, we've kept you muted too long. Uh, Solomon, let's first hear, we, we had a question earlier. How are you helping to lead this newly formed flock that is gathering around Lord of Glory in, in thinking about cross-cultural life together in ministry in Athens in this unique time of um, a new awareness of social justice and the different conversations going on around that. How, what is that yeah. like? What would you say to us about that? Well, I mean, um, I mean, this might be tongue in cheek, but to be sure, I've been black my whole life, right? So, and I've been like, my family has always been uh, following Jesus. So, Conversations about race and justice and the gospel are ordinary. ordinary. It's, it's what God has, has birthed me into. Um, and so it's been a, a, a blessing to do that. And, and similarly, um, Parker is not black, right? Um, but he's been, he's, the Lord has put on his heart um, the, the desire to, to lead a multicultural church for 10, 12 years or so. Yeah. I mean, so. The, the, the thing to say is that um, we've been having these conversations far before uh, these particular issues came up. And we are glad that they have come up, right? We are glad that we're able to have these conversations and more people are interested in these conversations now. Um, but we've been preaching the gospel the way that we've been preaching the gospel um, because it is the gospel. It's the full counsel of God that, um, that, that says that, the, that God actually cares about what's happening in our world and that um, the, the, the gospel is transcended to speak to the cultural matters of a time in a particular place. That's right. Um, so that being said, you know, we haven't really so much changed anything about the way that we're preaching the gospel. However, we do know that this is, um, has been a, 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 an amazing year of tumult, tumult and, and, and just um, unrest regarding race and so we have done things to try to respond um, we haven't engaged in in-person uh, worship yet right like a real worship gathering but we felt that it was important for us to in a socially distanced way uh, and we are a small congregation make some time to have a few conversations about race um, justice and the gospel so we did that um, Outside had some really interesting and, and, and you know uh, passionate conversations about those things, but it was really focused on making sure that the the members of our church had the opportunity uh, to hear what what we as leaders of the church um, were seeing and see how the gospel plays out in this aspect of life together. So um, we've been, we've been doing some of that stuff, and and we will probably do more of it but not in a way that um, really shifts us away from, you know, preaching the gospel, which includes these types of conversations. Amen to that. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just jump in there and just say, yeah, I, I think what Solomon's saying is so important that, uh, you know, really 
when you're living into communion across cultural boundaries, yeah. it just becomes a lifestyle, right? And it's not something that you do uh, occasionally because a crisis came up. Now, it doesn't mean we don't respond to crises, and we're glad people are, but it's kind of like um, we have to, we're kind of reminded that, oh yeah, people don't talk about this as regularly as we do, right? Because we, we, we are dealing with it with people in our congregation uh, all the time, you know? Uh, we see the racial disparities in our city. Uh, one of the things that happened in that move, which I, I wasn't really able to explain, is that, uh, you know, my current house where we've been in Athens for a long time. I was pastoring another church. Uh, we've been here for 12 years and we've been in the same house for 12 years. And, and that house is on one side of a historic racial boundary line that most people don't really acknowledge, but it's still tacitly there. Uh, by default, and it's one street, Baxter Street, on one side is predominantly white, almost yep. entirely, and on the other side, up to another street, it, it's almost entirely black, a historically African-American neighborhood with a federal housing project in it. And so what the Lord has done is he's, he's bounced us out of our nest on the white side, and he's put us in over on the black side where we've been doing a lot of outreach and connecting. And one of our visions, I mean, in this, in this church plant, um, you know, one of the things I've found with seeking unity, especially among black and white Americans, right? Now, this is not just cross-cultural unity, but especially this divide, right? Because I've been a member of New City Fellowship in St. Louis when I was in seminary for five years and wonderful. And one of the things I learned there is that it's, it's actually easier for us as, mm-hmm. as white folks typically it's often easier for us to connect with internationals deeply than it is for us to deeply bridge and connect with our black and white, I mean, our, our, our black brothers and sisters across this race boundary in America. And that, why is that, right? Well, my conviction is that it's because of the, the family history, right? Have you ever noticed how it's, often so often more difficult for you to minister to people who are from your own family than it is for you to minister to people outside your family right because you have baggage you have family history uh with your brothers your sisters your parents your children uh i think we have that baggage as a nation and so it's one thing for me to talk about reconciling with a black brother from west africa um and we don't have that same kind of pain between us but here uh, we do. And so moving across the street, uh, it's wonderful because the Lord has, we're not alien to that neighborhood anymore because we've had enough presence there that the neighbors already know who we are. And so what happened on Saturday, when we moved in on Saturday, and this is just God's hand. I mean, we weren't planning to move into this house. Already the lady across the street uh, told me, as soon as I told her, last week that we're going to be moving in she just lifted her hands and prayed and she said hallelujah she said you see my backyard she said we're going to have church right there Mm -hmm. and then already like one of the guys that's been involved in and out of our church on the streets and he's dealing with addiction already what yesterday or the day before because we showed up in his neighborhood and because i've been seeing him every day now he's going into a rehab program right and and it's like that's just we're living into that communion and shared burden together. And I think that the thing about COVID is COVID has taken away so many of the props. We don't have the freedom of travel. We don't have even uh, the the sports and athletics that we've enjoyed watching and what have you. And so what are you going to do? And I I think as a church, we've been talking about worship and so many of our benchmarks are based on large group worship gatherings. And uh, I get it. And I, I love large group as much as anybody. Uh, and, and God's hand is at work there. But I think we all know that as leaders and as, just as church members, uh, it's, isn't it somewhat easy if you have a really great large group gathering to kind of hide behind that and not to really be engaging on the person to person level and the shared burdens level. I don't know about you, but it's a lot easier for me when we're gathering in person to think, well, if I thought about calling somebody during the week or right. visiting them, I don't really have to because I know I'm going to see them on Sunday. Well, now I don't know that I'm going to see them on Sunday. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a kind of a shift of saying, hey, what, what, what am I really going to do personally to have more of a shared life with others? Uh, because large group worship is only one, one piece of it.
puzzle. I want to ask you guys both one quick question very briefly, and we're going to pivot in a final direction for the whole group. Uh, Parker or Solomon, whoever wants to field this, we had a question earlier. People loved hearing about, um, you know, your sense of how the, the personal spiritual disciplines are new and refreshing your lives. It's the difference, I think one of you said, between sanity. I think, Solomon, you said the difference between sanity and insanity. How are you bringing that to the congregation? The question was, how are you, as you're planting a new church, yeah. you can't be face to face with people. How are you bringing that spiritual discipline practice to the people? First by example. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. First by example. That's a good point. Um, by actually embodying it ourselves and actually um, letting the Lord order our lives in such a way that we aren't um, always frazzled right and always overwhelmed by the particular moment um the other thing that i was just going to say and it, it, it kind of goes off what you were just saying is the idea of really recapturing the concept of like pastoral ministry um because we don't have these these crutches of of uh you know a men's group here or these regular occurrences that we're we're seeing people um we really i'm i'm doing uh, a lot of just getting on the phone and calling people right um, and having that one-on-one -on -one conversation and it's an interesting thing like I'm all about direct interpersonal communication like with my brother Parker here in person but but what can happen uh, and what has happened is in just these these times of regular you know checking in on people and calling folks is that we really get a, a very robust picture of what's going on in their lives uh, and can kind of speak to people on these matters one of the things that God was putting on our heart um, in terms of us kind of doing more of our own spiritual discipline work in November was to try to re-emphasize the idea of just getting on the phone and calling people. And now we've had to do that, right? Um, and so, um, you know, really just kind of having conversations with people, asking people what's going on in, in their lives, uh, praying over them with it, but then also not just stopping there, but like trying to suggest Here's something that you can read that might help you with that. Here's a practice that I utilize, or this is a practice that a buddy of mine really likes. And you remind me of him, so I'll share this with you, and maybe maybe that'll work. And then calling him back, you know, a few days later and saying, hey, like, how did that go? Like, how did that, how did that centering prayer go? Did it go well? How did journaling work out? Um, that's really the main thing. We're also trying to do some things uh, with just, like, sending out videos and different things like that. But um, wherever we can kind of push that uh we're, we're really trying to lean in to do that hey, can I just say, quickly, quickly yeah we we are working at the beginning of this year we started a process of actually developing a questionnaire that we give to That's congregants right. and having a whole process solomon's been working on it that they go through to take an inventory of their spiritual life and spiritual disciplines and then they come and meet with us personally and we talk through those questions and then we give coaching and direction uh around that so that's something we're doing as well. That's great. So I'm hearing a common thread of contact. Yeah, this whole right. thing called Absolutely. the phone and uh, actually using this thing called the phone. Text is good, but phone is good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pivot a little bit more and maybe take us home with this category. And Josh, I'll start with you. Um, you know, what do you feel as a, a leader there in Knoxville, as a, as a church pastor and leader, what do you feel? are the unique opportunities of this moment and how we can step into those. I mean, we've said it a couple times, I think already, but you know, di disruption is really uncomfortable, but it can be really spiritually beneficial as well. It, it bumps us out of ruts that we were in and forces us to rethink sort of what are your, what are your first principles? Um, and that, that's what we've experienced as a church. It's forced us to go back and, say not just it, it has forced us to make a distinction between seeing our identity as a church as being tied up in our programs and it's it's forced us to say no how are we pastoring people how are we um really engaging in you know word sacrament prayer discipling our, our folks how does that shift in this new season and those are questions that you always are supposed to be asking uh, but when life just kind of rolls along you you don't always stop to reevaluate so i think that's a, a new opportunity for us to uh, ask questions. And I think some of what has happened too is different people kind of float to the top of who you're, we talked about this with, you know, you get on the phone with somebody that maybe you wouldn't have had that yes. kind of with. 
Um, and so the Lord just brings you, he just disrupts your, your yeah, social. A providential resorting of the cue of life in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And responding so, to that. I think that that's one of the things that we're, we're experiencing and seeing as an opportunity and, and then bringing to, there was one of the questions uh, earlier that, that we, we didn't address, but um, talking about seeing this as an opportunity to, to love our neighbors in new and fresh ways. Um, we have seen some of our relationships that were, were there, they were acquaintances that now are sort of becoming more central relationships that we can uh, lean into. So we have a, a local partner at an elementary school um, who's a, a wonderful woman who we love and we've worked with for a long time. That, that relationship has become really, really important in this season because she is our conduit to know how best to love our neighbors. Um, so that has moved from being just a, a, a really great relationship that we're thankful for to becoming a really, really important relationship. Mm. So. so having your eyes open to how God is restacking the deck, um, where are new opportunities? Who are new gatekeepers? Yeah. Who are the key people to open up new avenues of life and ministry and contact? Karen, any, your, what do you see as the unique opportunity in your mind for this season? Yeah, I mean, I think like we are just trying to constantly be creative about how to not just give our um, congregation and people who are attending content, which is obviously really important, but also how to connect them even when some of them don't want to be physically connected um, in person services. So how to connect them and then how to care for them, recognizing that not everything will do everything, all three of those things really well. So we're kind of going back to the drawing board. I mean, some of like what Parker and Solomon said, like your church plants, we've talked at it as a staff. And I know as this session has talked about how like, this is almost like we're a church plant again, at, at, at the beginning, kind of relaying a foundation. We found that partners, especially university partners, they cannot meet on RUF and REFI cannot meet on campus at all the semester. And so all of a sudden, the talks of how we've already been in relationship with those ministries, but how it how we re-engage and engage in new ways with those students and those ministries has, has been something that we've wanted to do. And this time has opened some of those doors as well. That's good. Charles, what do you think? What's, what are some of the unique opportunities there or, or for maybe for all of us? Yeah, so I think uh, I was looking back at the the pastoral letter I sent to the congregation as we got ready to open, and and it was really not much about the practicalities. It was, and I explicitly said I want to talk to the heart. Like, how do we how do we hold our heart during this time? And one of the things I specifically said was I don't want to go back to normal. Like that's not our goal because I think I want to see. God is God is up to something here. It's not that His mission is on hold. That His mission actually maybe to lean into maybe the things that are coming to the surface, particularly how do we hold our differences? I mean, we're getting ready to go into an election season that I think like 2016 is going to amp up the divisions that, that we experience and not just in the world, but in the church. So what would it be? I mean, I said, how, you know, how we worship him and how we love each other through our differences. That actually may be where God wants to grow his kingdom in us so that there's something better than the old normal. So that's where I want to keep us pressing into as a congregation is to say, you know what, let's, let's trust God that, that he really is. He's, he's kind, he's sovereign in the midst of this. And actually he's going to use this for his mission in our lives to grow the kingdom through the challenges, particularly, I guess, that the differences. So I think that's what I'm thinking about is the ways in which we're prone to division right now. How can we actually look to see God actually grow us in that. So like, we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do a Sunday school class. We don't know if it'll be in person or on zoom, but um, on kind of political discipleship. And one of the ideas, uh, we'll see if this works, but we're going to have a panel of a couple of people from the congregation who plan to vote for Biden and a couple of people who plan to vote for Trump. And I want us to talk up front about what does that look like and, and why and how do we respect and listen to each other in the midst of that? Because if we can't talk about it in the church, then I don't know where there is any hope in terms of what God wants to do in renewing the creation. So that's, that's kind of where my heart is. Safe places to apply the gospel and learn from one another. Um, if you have a link to any of that, please send that to Tracy. I know folks would love to see that. 
uh, if that is going to be uh, recorded and done virtually. Rod, um, how about you? What do you see as this opportunity in this moment? Uh, a couple of years ago, I always have a theological retreat every year. And uh, a couple of years ago, we invited Rankin Wilborn, who came and talked about his book, uh, Union with Christ. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book, by the way. And you might know he talks a lot about just what it looks like to to walk with, you know, to to to, uh, to to walk with God, and that it's a it's a step 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 kind of a thing, and it's and we want to try to go faster. And uh, on one of the pages, he says we might prefer to fly, and we may wonder if there's a shortcut, and there are some. But once you find out what they are, humiliation and suffering, you'll probably prefer to walk. <laughs> and uh, the reason I mention that is is that there's a sense in which. Uh, we do have, there is humiliation and suffering that's going on. Um, uh, humiliation in terms of coming to, to, um, to grips with uh, the, some of these issues as, as a, a majority white uh, congregation coming to grips with some of the issues in which even though we're California and we're progressive and all that kind of stuff, it really applies to us too. And uh, to, we're actually taking 13 weeks in a sermon series to talk about this, which I don't know that we would have otherwise. So the kind of the humiliation is, is we're leaning into that. And then the suffering as well. Uh, I, I'm challenging people to, to, not, to not live anxiously. And uh, I, I feel like it's true all around the country that, um, but it's, it's more true here is I feel like every season of life, there's a new invitation that's almost brought to you by a butler into how to be anxious and how to, how to be um, worried in this particular season of life. And it starts in childhood. And so I, I think I, we're, we're in seasons where these, you know, where we're really exposed and what does it mean to, what does it look like to walk in and then, and just create an, a, a place of honesty in order to do that. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's kind of where my head's at. That is great, Rod. Thank you. Parker and Solomon, any thoughts on what you see as key opportunities in this moment? Sure. I think that uh, everybody's been hitting on it. it. I think the opportunity is the, the, it's the flip side of the coin of the, the things that we feel are being taken away, right? So we've talked some about people not engaging in uh, the regular operations of worship and programs that we had in place. But I think that we have to ask ourselves the question, um, has the Lord been pleased with uh, the health of the church? And, you know, judgment begins with the household of God. Um, and it's who is it that brings plagues, right, and lifts them in the Bible? It's the Lord. Uh, the question is, are we listening to the Spirit of God? And what I see as the opportunity in this is that there's a hunger. Right? I see a hunger among a lot of people uh, to search and find for spiritual answers. And I see this as an evangelistic opportunity for sure and a sanctification opportunity in the life of the church. But I find it's a lot easier to talk about the things of God and about the hope of glory and about Christ and His resurrection with any and everybody. We're, we're in a culture, right, that, as one of my former pastors used to say, we, we, we think we're immune to death, right? And all of a sudden, everybody has been reminded in a dramatic way that we're not immune to death. And so um, there is significant spiritual opportunity uh, where to, to draw in a harvest for people who are hungry, hungry and searching, desperate for hope. I know multiple people uh, and and through connections more who have committed suicide. Um, and I have been convicted, you know, I'm somebody who have not been a big fan of social media, but I didn't have a Facebook account until like last year and I'm a church planter. But I've been starting to post stuff more because I do think that these social media, one aspect of it is kind of like the Romans roads, uh, the Roman roads that, that Paul traveled on, right? And the missionary, the gospel went forth with fire. Not and uh, structure, right? It's this space. 
Right. That's right. And, and people are out there and they're searching for what? They're searching for something that's going to fill them. And a lot of it's just going to be trash or it's going to be redirecting them to the same old props. But we have Jesus Christ. And so I've just been convicted to be more present uh, on social media. We've been revamping, you know, and, and putting more of our stuff online. And, and we're, we're going to be doing more core values videos and coaching some of that, that spiritual discipline coaching and just putting it out there for people. And people who we've had people come to church, by the way who are like in Chile, who we've had a lot of internationals that have been involved, right? People that have come and visited our church. And we had a missionary that we support in, in West Africa, even though, um, you know, we're a church plant. We wanted to be supporting mission, world mission from the beginning. And we had Macklin Basse just come and preach for us because it was that easy, right? And so it's striking that this is also a global pandemic. And why is it that God has thrust the globe into this situation? And now the, the church around the world is cert, uh, dealing with similar situations. I'm connected with a, a young pastor in Lahore, Pakistan, who's dealing with issues. And we've sent some support to him to just help them keep food on the table. And, 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 and there can be an opportunity, I think, here for the, the church. You know, God, God raises up kingdoms and he brings them down. But he does all of that. That is... Uh, the, the, the sifting out, the, the lowering of the high places and the lifting of the low, the making the rough places plain. For what? For the coming of the Lord. And so it's really Christ's kingdom we want to see established. Maybe there's an opportunity here, I think there certainly is, to connect more with the global church. Maybe have some missionary people you're connected with speak right in more to your, your direct uh, congregation when it's not missions week, you know, yeah. and, and be praying more uh, for the unity of the body around the world. Awesome. Uh, Parker, Solomon, if you can get to Tracy, any information people could connect to your spiritual disciplines, people are asking for that. Parker, uh, thank you. Solomon, take us home with a few closing comments, and then I'm going to close this. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the two thoughts that I have about what, what the Lord may be up to is to just show us, um, show us our idols, right? Um, and... And in doing so, just show the folly of our ways um, to show us just how inefficient our ways of living were um, and unwise they were and, and, and not life-giving they were. Um, I'm sh that's one thing that he is definitely uh, teaching me throughout all of this. Um, and, and, and the bigger thing there is to just recognize um, the desperate need that we have for Christ, right? Now we all know that that people need the Lord, right? We 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 understand this, but but definitely COVID nineteen has kind of leveled the playing field such that um, when I'm making my pastoral calls, I don't have to wonder if somebody is feeling anxiety or um, grieving the loss of some aspect of their life. I know they are, right? Because everyone is, right? Everyone is grieving. Everyone is feeling anxious, everyone is frustrated, everyone's dealing with anger, we're all dealing with the same thing. Um, and that has been, uh, just from a pastoral angle, it's been wonderful to help me just recognize, like, don't be in your head so much, just meet the people where they are. Like, speak to the most important things every single time you get the opportunity to do that, um, because it really does matter, because people are, um, well, because the word of God is true in that our lives are sustained by his word, right? You know, like we love food, food and water, that's great. But like, actually, the word of God is true when it says that, that we sustain, we are sustained on, on, on that word. So just really leaning into that and, and trying to share that with people um, is what we're, we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you all panelists for being with us. Great job. Uh, I want to close in prayer. We're going to pray especially for Rod Miles' father, Dick, who is uh, very near death, and um, he's uh, in his late 80s, and we want to pray for God's grace on his life uh, in this space and Rod and his family. I want to let you know that next week in this space, we will have a very special webinar. Uh, we will have a Kingdom Conversations with Richard Pratt. So, Richard Pratt, founder and president of Third Mill Ministries, is going to talk about what he sees in the moment, uh, what he sees for the church here in North America and in the world, 
Um, so I'll be, I'll be sort of curating a conversation with Richard. You can get signups on that probably starting this afternoon or tomorrow on the MA website for that. So let's close in prayer. Thank you for being with us. Rod, we want to especially pray for you and your dad. Let's close. Father, we are grateful for this time. We thank you that brothers and sisters here today have given us by your grace in them faith to look forward, faith for you to look and for your presence with us now to renew us, to give us fresh repentance and faith in this space, fresh hope in the gospel, fresh experiences of you, uh, even in the hardest of times. As Solomon reminded us, that points us to the cross, which was the worst of times, which becomes the best of times, because you are there. Yeah, and thank you, O oh Lord, for that comfort. Lord, we want to particularly ask that your church could flourish again as we are pruned and renewed in the gospel. We want to flourish each of us as Christians in that way. Lord, we want to particularly ask grace on your servant, Rod, and on all his family around his father Dick's illness. We would pray for healing for Dick, for full salvation for Dick, for your loving presence to break in uniquely in Dick's life in this space. Be with him in life and in death. Would you, O oh Lord, heal him completely and save him through and through? Or would you bring him to yourself even in these last days before you were to take him home? We ask you, O oh Lord, to work in Dick's life. And we praise you that you're a God who loves to do this. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord. Bless all who have been with us and all who may tune in later. Bless our families. Be at work in us and through us. We pray for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Lord bless you. Keep you. Uh, come back next week and hear Richard Pratt. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.